Well, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lori Marino. I'm the founder and president of the Whale Sanctuary Project, and this is one of the Whale Sanctuary Project's live series. This is World Orca Day, and we're very excited at the Whale Sanctuary Project, and we are creating the first authentic seaside sanctuary designed to welcome both orcas and belugas, and this is a rendition of it. And it's over 100 acres. It's in Port Hilford, Nova Scotia. We are thrilled to welcome everyone and welcome you to find out more about what we're doing up in Nova Scotia at www.whalesanctuary.org. And if you have any questions about that, you can always email me afterwards. But let's get back to our webinar. So our guest today is, is Ingrid Visser, Dr. Ingrid Visser. I am so pleased to have her on. And Ingrid and I have known each other for many, many years. We've published papers together. And she's joining us from New Zealand. And it's already the 15th there. So today is her second World Orchid Day this year. Um, so we're celebrating that with her. Um, now, I'm sure all of you know that uh, Ingrid has been researching orcas for over 30 years now. Um, but uh, some of you might not know that she, uh, and this, this is really neat, she used to live on a boat uh, when she was a teenager. She sailed around the world with her family, and she even had a pet rescue monkey. So how cool is that? Um, so she visited more than 30 countries before she had been on a commercial plane, imagine. And her most read book was a whale and dolphin identification guide, which she used to confirm the species she saw on her adventures. Ingrid has now seen more than 50% of the world's species of cetaceans. And uh, you know she's gonna tell us all about her scientific work and her advocacy work. And I just wanna say that I'm honored to have her. Uh, she is also an advisor to the Whale Sanctuary Project. And uh, I wanna start off by just welcoming Ingrid Visser. Thank you. Well, you know, you mentioned that book, Laurie. I still have it. This is the one, <laughs> the actual book that sailed around the world with me when I was living on the yacht, and it's still one of my prized possessions. So, but look, hey, happy World Orca Day to everybody. It's amazing. I've been watching where everybody's saying that they're coming from, from so many different countries and lots of different places within some other countries. It's really fantastic. It's, it's great. It's great. So, yes, thank you. We have people from all over the world. Uh, joining us today. Which and, is appropriate on World Orca Day, right? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ingrid, my first question to you is, when did you decide to create World Orca Day and why? Ooh. <laughs> so it, it sort of started brewing in the back of my head around 2000. And I was fascinated with how many people were coming up and telling me when I was giving presentations or I was working out in the field, whatever I was doing, people wanted to um, express their passion for these animals and how in many cases they'd changed their lives, you know, they'd, they'd seen a movie, they'd read a book, they'd had a personal experience, or they were just absolutely fascinated with these animals. And I thought, well, how can we as a collective community celebrate these animals? And I started looking into what sort of world days there were for other animals. And there was such a range from tigers to sparrows to, you know, they're all out there and no one had done one for orca. And I'm like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> So I sort of started planning it around then, and then it, it took quite a while to, to reach to the point where I was ready to launch it, and I launched it at a World Whale Conference in Boston in 2013, and that was in November, and so the first time it was celebrated was in on the 14th of July, 2013. That's great. Uh, well, I think maybe this might be a good time to ask uh, you, Ingrid, uh, to share some of your work with us. And then after that, we'll get into a discussion in our Q&A. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I have been working with Orca in Antarctica for a while. So I thought I'd sort of touch base a little bit about that. Um, 
most people will be aware, but some people might not, that there's at least four different types of orca in Antarctica. Uh, these ones are what are known as type A. They're black, white, and gray. They look very similar to orca from other regions around the world, uh, but there's other ecotypes down there. And the other ones tend to be gray, and you'll often see that they have uh, a gray line that comes up from the saddle patch. Can you see my mouse as I move over that slide yes. there, Laurie? Yeah, okay, yes. great. And so it extends right out from the bottom of the saddle patch. And if you look at this animal, you'll see it sweeps right over the dorsal area um, of the animal and comes down the front of the eye patch. And on this one, you can see it coming right down to the front of the eye patch. So the darker gray area is typically called the dorsal cape. And you'll also see the angle of the eye patch on these animals is quite slanted. And so that's one of the things that you look for for different type ecotypes. So when I talk about the angle, um, you can see here, this is an eye patch angle. So you draw a line from the front of the eye patch to the back, and then you look where that line exits out. And so in this case, it's behind the saddle patch. And in this case, it's in front of the saddle patch. So this was a paper that I published together with Perio in 2000. And we were looking at eye patches of different populations of orca. But in Ingrid, Antarctica, Ingrid can yeah. you describe for maybe some new people in the audience, what an ecotype is? Sure. So an ecotype is a population of orca that typically are found in one region or one area, uh, and they don't interbreed with others. They often look very different, but sometimes the differences are quite subtle, but they're usually acoustically very different as well. Uh, they have different cultural behaviors, so who they hang out with and how they disperse from their family groups. And then they often also have cultural uh, behaviors that are linked to what they feed on and how they feed. So there's lots of different variations in, in ecotypes, and some of them uh, can be as subtle as just um, the shape of the dorsal fin. Thank you. Pleasure. And so the, in, and one of the Antarctic uh, features that we look for with the Antarctic orca is this yellow tinge, and it's not actually that there's pigmentation on the animals. It's a, um, a diatom, a single-celled algae that's growing on the skin of the orca. And so you can see this adult male um, that's the, that pretty much fills the screen here, and he's got lots and lots of diatoms on him. And then this juvenile that's spy hopping here, and you can see um, some of the diatoms on the um, lower jaw area. So I started going down to Antarctica in the 1990s, and uh, I've been going as often as I can. And these red pins are some of the places that I've seen uh, orca. I haven't yet been fortunate to go around to the other side of Antarctica, uh, but I, I know that there are orca there. I just haven't been there myself and seen them. And when I'm down in Antarctica, I'll go by working on ecotourism ships. So this is an icebreaker on the left. And when I'm on board, I'm... Uh, usually driving the small inflatable boats and uh, taking the people out to see the animals. And so this is one of the other ships that I've worked on. And you can see this is a type B orca with a really big white eye patch. And you can see the dorsal cape over the, the back of it as well. Mm -hmm. And when I'm on board the ships, I give lectures and presentations. So something similar to what we're doing now, but a little bit more focused. And uh, we'll, I'll talk there about things like the Antarctic Killer Whale Identification Catalog, which I set up. And that was the first identification catalog for orca in Antarctic waters. Mm -hmm. And when we're working on these ships, the weather can be quite horrific, obviously, down in Antarctica. Uh, and often we'll actually be operating just from the big ships and we get lucky enough that the orca will come in close and, and we can get some great behaviours and photos. But we also do get those spectacular days down in Antarctica where conditions allow us to go out in the inflatable boats. And uh, this is me in the purple and you can see the orca will come up to those boats as well, which is really quite a magical moment. Mm -hmm. But at times we're based on... Uh, research basis. So this is Scott Base, the Antarctic base at McMurdo Sound, and this one is for New Zealand. And when we're at those locations, uh, we typically go out with ski doos uh, and we take all our research equipment on sleds. And then we've got our tents with us as well, because if the weather turns bad, that we're self-sufficient, but also sometimes we'll stay out overnight. 
Uh, so we pitch our tents on the ice shelf and uh, secure them with blocks of ice so they don't blow away. And this is my tent. And you can see some of my research equipment there. And then this black cable over here uh, is going down into the crack because I wanted to record the sound of the wet owl seals when they go in here and, and swim. So this is about two o'clock in the morning uh, and they're all having a little bit of a nap, uh, but they do tend to go in and out all, all the time. And then this is inside my tent, uh, two sleeping bags because it's so cold. Uh, also a hot water bottle. And I use the hot water bottle also not just to keep me warm, but also to keep the equipment warm because it gets so cold, the equipment won't work if you don't keep it inside your sleeping bag with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do go out in the helicopters and meet the locals. Uh, and here you can see, again, our gear uh, on the side here that we've got in case we get stuck with bad weather. So when we're out there, we're uh, alongside the edge of the ice and we're secured with harnesses and ropes to ice picks that are um, uh, ice screws that are screwed into the ice so that if we do fall in, uh, we're able to pull ourselves back out again. And uh, we're in this instance, we've got a Delhi penguins out here on the left and then a two type C orca. They're just about to head under the ice here. Now I'm holding a pole with a GoPro on the end. And then I've also got a cable that runs all the way up to some funky looking glasses that I'm wearing. These are heads up display glasses. You can see an orca heading around just behind me there. Mm -hmm. And the orca are hanging around in this area because all this broken ice is from an icebreaker ship that went through. And the orca are trying to get underneath the ice to feed on the uh, Patagonia and, oh, sorry, the Antarctic toothfish. And you can see actually the path where the orca has been. So they need to come out for air, obviously. So we know that they're going to come back into this region when they come to surface. So we can stand in one location and pretty much the animals come to us. So this is the type of picture that I'm getting when I'm using the GoPro. You can see that beautiful uh, dorsal cape coming right over the front of his eye patch. And here you can see a little bit of the ice just behind him. So some of my research in Antarctica has included things like uh, in 2006, I was the first person to film in high definition the orca washing the seals off the ice. And uh, we published that, my colleagues and I, in 2008. And of course, since then, it's been um, filmed quite a bit and has appeared in a number of different documentaries around the world. So all of this sort of science you can find on my website, you can go to the research tab and then down the bottom and you can go to other projects. And for example, here's the Antarctic Orca. And down the bottom of that, you'll find right down here, there's all the PDFs that you can download from my research. But there's links between the Antarctic research and the New Zealand research for me as well, because uh, in 1997, I was the first person to document Antarctic orca leaving that area and coming up to New Zealand. We don't know exactly where they came from, but we do know where I found them. So I found them up here in the Bay of Islands. It's approximately 4,800 kilometers, 3,000 miles between Antarctica and this location. We can clearly see this is a type B. We've got the dorsal cape, we've got the pale gray, and we've got these very large eye patches. Now, when I photographed this animal back and it's and everybody that was with it in 1997, Laurie, you'll remember these days. Um, <laughs> this was when we were still using slide film. And oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have I'm, nightmares about that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right, me too. Hideously expensive. I mean, digital cameras probably weren't even imagined and they certainly weren't available back then. Uh, and when I went to publish the paper about this encounter with the Antarctic orca, uh, my research was really poo-pooed. And people said, well, you must, we know you go and work down in Antarctica. You must have mixed up your slide film. And you've got the film from Antarctica. You got it processed when you'd photographed New Zealand orca. And I'm like, well, no. And here we go. This is a picture that I took then. You can see how old it is. It's all scratched up but it clearly shows um, people on a tourist boat wearing shorts and t-shirts. And this boat is identifiable as one from the Bay of Islands. So we were able to get this paper published. But then in 2001, we had the type C orca turn up in New Zealand, again, very close to the location where the type Bs had been photographed. 
And in this instance, uh, I preempted what people were going to say and I made sure that I got a photograph with the New Zealand coastline in the background. Mm -hmm. Clearly that's mm -hmm. not Antarctica. So that was really exciting. And since then, we've got photo identification matches between Antarctica and New Zealand and working in collaboration with some Italian scientists who were satellite tagging orca. We've also got evidence of them coming up into this area. So really exciting stuff. But as part of that research, I was also looking at um, these oval wounds on the orca. So this one's a fresh one. And down here, we've got a scar. And I was fascinated with these because to me, it was telling me a story about these animals. And in 2001, I also found the same thing on the type Cs. So these open wounds and then the healed scars. Now they actually come from this little shark. And this is a what's called a cookie cutter shark or Isistius. And there's two different species. And these are deep dwelling sharks that live predominantly in temperate to tropical waters. Certainly, they've never been found in Antarctic waters. So that was telling me for sure that orca were traveling. I mean, we had the evidence of the photographs, but if there were healed scars, this was showing it wasn't just a once off event that they were leaving the ice. And then in 2004, one of the ecotypes that we find here in New Zealand called the pelagic ecotype and pelagic means open ocean. So in many ways, um, it's the concept is similar to the offshore orca that are found in the Pacific Northwest, but these are a different ecotype again. And you can see from this photograph, um, there's at least 17 different cookie cutter shark bite marks on this individual. And at that time, this was the most recorded uh, cookie cutter shark bites on any orca anywhere in the world. So that was a big deal to find because in the coastal orca, we'd never seen them before. Then in 2007, we started seeing cookie cutter shark bites on the New Zealand orca. Now we've got records going back to the 1990s and even back far as the 1980s and no cookie cutter shark bites. So this was really interesting and we're not sure whether this is a change in pattern of the sharks or whether it's a change in pattern of the orca, whether it's the distribution or where they're going, we just we just don't know at this stage. Mm -hmm. So then, in in, also in 2007, uh, when I was down in Antarctica, again, you can see the icebergs in the background, uh, I photographed orca, this was type A orca, down in Antarctica with cookie cutter shark bites that were partially healed and completely healed. So again, indicative that the orca were moving out of Antarctica. And if we look at this map, it's a little bit blurry because it comes from a wee while ago and from a scientific paper, but all those black dots are the locations where Azisteus or cookie cutter sharks have been uh, documented. And the red pins at the bottom, those are the locations where I've documented orca with these bite marks. So it's clear something's going on there. It's highly likely that a lot more orca are leaving Antarctica than we currently understand. Uh, and part of gathering all that information together is this paper that I uh, wrote together with a colleague and uh, we looked at cookie cutter shark bites on orca all around the world. Mm. And then in 2015, we found uh, again on the pelagic orca, these little doodads. I don't know, can you see these little things hanging off the tail here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're called tassel barnacles or the Latin name. Oh, Hang on, let's try this. There we go. Tassel barnacles, are the Latin name is Xenobalinus globicipitus. And uh, they attach themselves at the base like a normal barnacle, but they've got this long, soft body. And at the top here, they have the cirri or the feeding part of the barnacle. And in this case, the orca was flicking her tail and all the water is being dispelled from the barnacle as it's being flicked. Mm. And the tail, this tail belongs to an orca called Maya. And she had over 80 xenos on her, all over her body in different areas. And they tend to be congregated on the trailing edges of pectoral fins and tail flukes and dorsal fins. Mm -hmm. So we published a paper on that in 2000. And that was the first evidence anywhere in the world of how long xenobalinus can stay on any cetacean at all. So that just gives you a little bit of a hint of some of the science that I'm doing at the in the past, and then I've got more coming up. We've got a conference 
that you and I are both attending, Laurie, in, in the first week of August, and I'm presenting a whole bunch of um, research there. So follow me or the Orca Research Trust or both on social media, and we'll be able to give you some heads up on that. And I'm um, also talking at the moment with a film crew with the potential to do a documentary about the orca. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to share some news about that soon too. So there we go. That was a whirlwind tour wow. of some of my research. <laughs> That's, that was just phenomenal. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Um, before we get to our Q&A, I really, you know, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, what you think is one of the most remarkable things that you've learned about orcas and all the time that you've been studying them. What has struck you about? Yeah, that? yeah, wow, that's a great question, Laurie. I think, who, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> um, Go for I, it. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's the diversity. I think the parallels between humans and orca are there's so many parallels that we can draw and and we look at cultural diversity with humans and how diverse that is and everywhere that I go and I've, I see orca I see this different cultural diversity and I think it is completely overlooked um, in the general sense not by orca scientists and whale biologists but in the, in the general sense people tend to think not orcaholics like all of us um, <laughs> that, are, that are on the webinar here, but, you know, that the general public just seem to think that an orca is an orca and it's all the same. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a big role for World Orca Day and, and everybody who's here with us on the webinar to help educate people about just how diverse they are and each population should be protected as, a, as its own entity. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, and in just from a very foundational level, I mean, this kind of work and this message speaks to the fact that it's true that many people see animals as just this monolithic thing, orcas versus a beluga whale versus a blue whale versus a horse versus an elephant, and they're all the same. But now we know that they're not, that, that there are individual communities that have yeah. cultures, their own cultures so very different from each other, just as we know that there are cultures among humans yes, and yes. also that there are individual differences within those cultures. Absolutely, right? absolutely. I mean, the personalities, personalities of, of, of the various orca that I've met from, be it at Keiko or Maya or, or any of the orca that I've met around the world, you know, there's very strong personalities in all of them. And, and some of them are very consistent and some of them change as the animals change through their, their life periods. Mm -hmm. So you might have a calf that's very bold and, and will, you know, very curious and fun and playful and um, playing with everybody else in the group. And then that young calf might become a mum and suddenly she becomes much calmer and stoic and, and you know, she's watching her calf so and sort of like, no, you can't go and do that naughty stuff. I know I used to do it as a kid, but you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the rescue and rehab efforts you've been part of? Because that's a really important part of your work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, New Zealand, we didn't know this at the time when I was starting doing my research, but New Zealand has the highest rate of orca strandings in the world. I mean, mm. we average one a year. That, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you compare it to, say, Australia, they average one every 14 years. Mm. So, you know, one a year is pretty high. And one of the things that I've really noticed when I'm doing the research with the orca here in New Zealand is that strandings are happening a lot more than the average person realizes as well, because you'll get a stranding that um, the animal needs rescuing and that makes the media. But I'm out with these animals and I'll see strandings happen and there could be the whole group could strand and then they get off themselves or there yeah. could be an individual who strands and then gets off by himself or herself. And so, the, but it's good to be there on standby in case they need help, right? And, and one of the things that I've really noticed in those scenarios is that it's often linked to the way that these animals are hunting. Mm 
And so when they're hunting for rays in very shallow waters and they're so focused on getting that food uh, yeah. that they're, they're often misjudging a wave or the depth of the water or the stickiness of the mud because they're, they're, they're going over the top of the mud and then the mud's getting stickier and stickier yeah. and then there's less and less water and then suddenly it's like and then they're stuck there. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's almost like a suction. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's the same in Argentina. Of course, uh, I'm sure everybody on the webinar here is familiar with uh, the orca that come up on the beach at Punta Norte and take the sea lions. So mm -hmm. I'm a co-founder of a research project there called Punta Norte Orca Research. Mm -hmm. And you can follow them. They're, they've got some amazing photographs on their Instagram account. And, and just you can go to the website and find that. I, I'm sure Caroline will be able to post the um, the link in there for us I've noticed that she's posting some other stuff so go here um, yep. and and those orca you know they run the risk of stranding as well because they're mm -hmm. in the beach zone and they've actually launched themselves um, up onto the beach right so they're in that wave area the wave zone and and then they launch themselves and if they make a mistake they can easily get stuck because they're so far yep. up on the beach and some of them do um, there's been a few rescues there, but most of them learn from a really, really young age and how to surf. And one of the uh, posters that I'm presenting at the conference with my colleagues, Juan and Jorge, uh, from Argentina, is about uh, the orca comparison of how these orca are, are navigating these shallow waters, particularly the surf zone, yeah. and that young animals are, are being taught how to surf, for example, when they're just days old, they start learning. Mm -hmm. That's in incredible. small ways, just like we do with our kids. You know, you don't take them out in the pipeline on the first day, but, you know. Um, right, yeah. right. You don't go out into the deep end immediately. Yeah. But you, yeah. little steps, little steps. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Well, you've got an amazing skull behind you and as someone who's done a lot of work with crania and fossil cetaceans and all kinds I'm immediately drawn to that incredible skull behind you can you yeah. can you say what who that is what that is <laughs> And uh, what else yeah. are the features of it? Yeah, well, actually, it was at the back of the room and I brought it forward specifically <laughs> for the webinar because I think That's it's good. such an incredible, uh, well, yeah, it's just, it's mind-blowing to me every time I see it and I see it every day in my office. Mm -hmm. And so it's a replica uh, and it's made of resin and uh, it's cast from a northern resident female. And... Uh, you can see the, the really large teeth on it, obviously, and that's how the teeth uh, typically look for a wild orca, you know, in comparison to, as we know, um, the broken and cracked and worn down teeth that you typically see in captive orca. And I thought actually it would be kind of fun to show you a, a replica tooth up close as well, Laurie. And wow. so, yeah, this gives you an idea of the size of a tooth, right? And they're, and they're quite flat, like most people think that they're rounded, but they're, they're actually quite right. flat. And the tooth sits buried in the gum up to about there, right? Mm -hmm. And then if we compare that, this is the size of a sperm whale tooth. <laughs> so, and of course, these guys are eating these guys. So <laughs> that tells you something too, right? It's um, not all yeah. in the teeth. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and in how you gang up on, on the other animals too, right? And you cooperate, I should say gang up. It's, it's cooperation. Yeah. Well, is that, you know, it's so interesting, that cooperation, the sperm whale is the largest brain in the world, Yes. but yes. the kill, but the orca has the most convoluted cortex in the world. Right. And, and as a neurobiologist, how would you interpret that? Well, how I interpret that is the same way I would interpret the level of convolutions in any mammalian brain, including the human brain, which is that brains get wrinkled up when you have to put a lot of tissue, a lot of neocortical tissue into a cranium. Yeah. So what that means is that in their evolutionary history, orcas have had to cram a lot of neocortex into their cranium and scrunch it up. What's neocortex? It's the part of the brain that uh, is, has to do with problem solving, thinking, self-awareness, all these so-called high-level cognitive abilities. 
Um, so uh, that's what our neocortex does. That's what other mammalian neocortices do. That's what the orca cortex is doing, and they have a lot of it. Yeah, well, I mean, you and I both know how smart these animals are and, and yep. how uh, empathetic they are. It was the mm -hmm. classic cases of, of orca carrying their calves for days mm -hmm. and weeks. I've, I've seen it myself personally, uh, and, and mm -hmm. it's just tragic to see, but it's, I think it's, for, for me as a biologist, and, I, and I'm sure it's the same for you as a neurobiologist, Laurie, it's it's the real life evidence of how that brain is being implemented and, and being used. It's not just here's a brain and, and we know they're smart, but and, and we know they are cognitive and they have emotions, but here's the evidence of that behavior actually being out there in the real world, right? And you have to go back and forth to infer from the brain and the behavior. To yes. One informs the other. Yeah. yeah. And that's what's so fascinating about going back and forth between those two areas. Right. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I want to just ask one of the questions, then we're going to get to the Q&A because I know there's 81 questions so far. So we've got, <laughs> no, <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> we have our work cut out for us. Okay. Um, I just want to mention um, the fact that we have, uh, we recently, well, it's 2019 now, but yeah. uh, published a paper that got quite a bit of attention in the Journal of Veterinary Behavior mm -hmm. on um, some of the uh, putative harms to orcas living in concrete tanks and the stresses they endure, and then how that understanding can help us understand why it is that their health, their physical and mental well-being in marine parks is so compromised. Um, do you want to say anything about that? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot to say, Laurie. Uh, yeah. We could have a whole webinar just on that paper, I think. <laughs> I think so. I, think uh, so. I mean, uh, we know that we're on the right side of history for um, standing up for these animals and advocating for their welfare. It manifests itself in so many different ways to me as a biologist that's, that's observed these animals in the wild. And I think that for those that are advocating to keep them in captivity, there is often that disconnect. They have really focused experience of watching them in captivity. And they don't have the comparative of what it's like for these animals out in the wild and how they behave that's different. Mm -hmm. And they will attempt to um, conflate the two. For example, uh, I've heard claims that the tooth rate marks that you see on wild orca are the same as the tooth rate marks that you see on orca in captivity. And there may be some truth to that in that it could be possibly aggression related. But I think what the difference is that in captivity, these animals are being forced to socialize with animals that they may normally not. So, for example, or, uh, in Loro Parque in Spain, Morgan the orca, uh, she is from Norway and she's been put with captive born orca who were hybrids from uh, basically from SeaWorld in the States, from the orca that they've collected over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the aggression that I saw there, I mean, she, she was rammed so hard that she was lifted out of the water. Mm. And you, you just never see that sort of behavior going on in the wild. You see young ones playing and they're rambunctious and, and things happen, but it's, it's not that, that concentrated and really focused aggression that you see in uh, right. captivity. And, and the same with the teeth, you know, the captivity industry will often tell you that the teeth that are worn in captivity, it's, well, you see worn teeth in the wild, therefore it's the same. And, and that's just pulling the wool over people's eyes and, and trying to hoodwink them and smoke and mirrors, you know, like watch here and something else is going on over here. Because the angle of the uh, 
the wear on the teeth is completely different compared to in the wild and captivity. Um, wow. The type of breaks is different and the causative factors. So the orca, as you know, uh, you know, they're, they're chewing on the concrete or gnawing on the concrete. They're, they're um, smashing up on the bars. They're breaking their teeth on the toys. And in the wild, um, broke, broken teeth typically seem to occur from uh, when they're hunting. And the worn teeth seems to be a combination of uh, potentially sucking in water. So it wears down the teeth. And, and people say to me, but can't, hang on, teeth are really hard. And, and how can water wear them down? And I'm like, well, the Grand Canyon was worn away by water. So, you know, you can wear away teeth from water too. Um, but also that's a systemic thing that, that happens as the animal ages. And mm -hmm. yet in captivity, we're seeing animals that are just a few years old with, with the worn, broken teeth. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so yeah. it's, it's different causes, different causes. Absolutely. Um, and, and the hunting it is, if you look at just the hunting alone, right, if it happens in the wild from hunting, and we know that in captivity, they're not hunting because the food is just thrown into the back of their mouths, mm -hmm. then you know that it, it, that tooth damage cannot come from the same things that they're saying, well, it happens in the wild, it happens in captivity. It, right. It's really not the same. It's different. Well, yeah. we could go, this one of the things we outline in our paper, Yes, that's a stereotypy and oral stereotypy, which is yeah. a stress-related uh, problem um, that uh, the majority of workers in captivity have. Um, yes. And we could talk about that and so many other things, but I do want to get to the, the Q&A because there's so many great questions. And I think I, I'm going to just start out because there's been a, there have been a couple of questions about the barnacles. So we're just going to start out. Oh, are okay. those barnacles harmful to the orcas and how do they get them off? <laughs> yeah, well, that we don't really know whether they're harmful or not. It, it doesn't seem that they are because we think what's happening is that they settle. Well, we know they settle when they're tiny, tiny little larvae, microscopic larvae. And they're just floating around in the water and the orca swims past and then they settle on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we think that they, they start to settle anywhere on the whole animal. And then it, as the um, animal swims, the hydrodynamics mean that um, there's some vortexes right at the trailing edges and the larvae manage to hook on right there. Mm -hmm. And then they slowly grow and grow and grow until you get um, the base of the barnacle is embedded below the upper dermis of the skin. And it's down into the, um, sometimes right down into the meat, but certainly as far as the blubber yeah and okay. so we don't think that it's too painful because it starts out as something really really small and yeah. you don't see the orca constantly banging their tails to get them off right um, in the case right. of that photo with Maya um, she was actually coming over to the boat and and she came so fast because uh, she's really really bold and that she I think she misjudged things so then she suddenly went whoops and she put her tail up like this so <laughs> that she could go underneath the boat it was really remarkable and we were just stationary as she came hurtling over and managed oh, that's to amazing. a stunning photo yeah well here's a really poignant question from Anne Marie and she asks do you still see some of the orcas from your early work and rescues and if so is there a recognition of each other uh, yes, we do see them. Uh, we see there's an individual that I've just written a book chapter about, was it last year, I think? Yes, Ben. Uh, so we rescued him uh, in the late 1990s. Wow. And he's still around today. And he was going to be shot, actually. The government department was on their way to go and shoot him because um, he had some blood in the, they, they dug out a little bit of a pool around one of his fins and there was blood in there and they thought, oh, well, you know, if there's blood, we have to kill him. And I actually chartered a helicopter to get there before they, the guy with the gun got there. <laughs> and oh I, yeah, and I landed on the beach and running down there, you know, just run, 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 and, and got there just before they did. And I said, you know, there's no way you're going to shoot him. Um, we're going to give him a chance. Yeah. And here we are. Uh, 20 plus years on and he's still going and the really amazing thing is that uh, we've been plotting all his movements that we have photographs of oh and when we plotted that out he traveled the equivalent of a trip around the world oh my gosh yeah yeah part after the stranding and and the cool thing for that is that it's only in New Zealand waters he doesn't leave New Zealand as far as we know 
So you can get wow. that on, on the website. There's the book chapters free to download on the website. That's the just org, amazing. Research.org. Sorry, it must, we'll put it on the we'll put it on the chat there too. Right. I mean, that must be so satisfying personally to yeah. see him out there living his life, and yeah. he could have been gone. Absolutely, but, absolutely. Right. right. And, and we had a female uh, who was tangled in a craypot line, and we talk about her in our paper as well, Laurie. And and the the stress captivity one That's talking right. about how there's that empathy and and animals supporting and looking after each yes. other. Yes. And and she was tangled in a line, and her. Uh, current calf and her previous calf were both underneath her supporting her and uh, when I uh, the the people who found her they tried to get close to her every time they did everybody sunk below the surface so they couldn't rescue her and they called me and I came uh, it took me a couple of hours to drive there to get to her but um, they kept supporting her during all that time her calves and then when I arrived, um, I put a camera in the water on a pole, just like you saw that I do in Antarctica. Yes. To have a look at the line. And the calves are coming right up and they're looking at the camera and they check it all out. And then they both sort of separated like this is it to say, okay, we know you, we know the boat, the camera's not going to be a problem, come in. And then I went right in there, filmed it. And she let me come in alongside, pull the line up, bring her alongside the boat and untangle her. And then... It was about a week later, I got a call, there were orca in the Bay of Islands, where the, that pin was in the, the map of New Zealand, where I'd seen the Antarctic orca. And I went up there and it was her and her family. And they came over to the boat and they were literally pushing each other out of the way to be able to get up to the oh. side of the boat, um, which I felt was a kind of, you know, you don't want to put too many human emotions on it, but it was almost like a thank you. That was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so touching. Um, and, and it's not an uncommon thing. I mean, people have talked about the fact that after you rescue them, sometimes there's an acknowledgement of that. Yes. Um, and who knows what they're thinking, but it's just certainly an amazing story. Oh, look, Laurie, if I had one, if I could ask for one thing, and it would be like, you know, the genie in the bottle wish, it would be that I could talk to and understand them talking to me to Orca. You know, to, to, yeah, to be able yeah. to have a conversation with them and like we're having now a dialogue and talk exactly. about experiences and all of that sort of thing, that would be, and I get goosebumps thinking about it now. Can you I imagine know. even one hour of a conversation with an orca, what we could learn? I know, well, what we could learn. Yeah. Um, I think maybe our relationship with these animals in yeah. some ways would be different if they could tell us what they want and what they need. And it's just the idea of, I mean, there's so many sophisticated studies out there using AI and all mm -hmm. kinds of things to, to decode the communication system of orcas and dolphins. And they're all incredibly fantastic and fascinating. And I think really what we all really want is to just go up to an orca or a dolphin, another kind of dolphin or any other, and just say, How's your day been going? Yeah. How, how's, how are your kids? What's yeah. going on? You know, yeah. Yeah. Do, you know, that kind of level of communication. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, going back to this rescues uh, thing, we've got an episode of the 0800 Sea Orca YouTube uh, mm. series that, that we've got going at the moment. And uh, we've got a link for that too. And that the next episode is actually about one of these rescues. And I don't want to do a spoiler alert, but but watch the ending. <laughs> and and uh, you, I think in there, you really get a feeling of, of how big the animals are as well. And it's a really powerful episode for me. I, it was I was nearly in tears watching it again because yeah. it was a few years ago that we we did this and um, to see the footage it was really raw but it was also very satisfying to know that he was rescued yeah oh yeah that's gosh. coming up soon uh, on the last day of world orca week actually oh my gosh okay <laughs> well we can, we can post that nice. um what do you I mean there are a lot of uh folks in the audience who are students. Yeah. And I know we, so both <laughs> share, yeah, we both share real concern for making sure that students who are interested in studying cetaceans have a way to do that 
yeah, and yeah. can facilitate that path. So here's a question from uh, Samantha. What would you suggest to a little girl, and I would add a little boy, who wants to study orcas in the wild like you? Any kid, right? Any kid, any kid, any adult. It doesn't really any matter. Any adult, you, right. yeah, exactly. exactly. If, yeah, if you want to study orca, I think the one bit of advice that I would give you is that don't give up because I was told from when I was, I, I mean, I, I was about six, I guess, and I really knew that I wanted to work with whales and dolphins. Mm -hmm. and, and I was told that I would have to go and work in an aquarium to do that. And I knew at that age that wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I didn't understand why, but I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do. And there's so many different things that you can do in studying whales and dolphins. I mean, you might not be able physically or financially to go down the path that I've gone down of being out in the field, but you can do incredible things by helping with uh websites if you're a social media person helping an ngo with their social media uh mm -hmm. if you are an engineer you know can i i am so looking forward to the day now that it's really starting to happen with cars but we're going to have electric boats out there so it's really quiet mm -hmm. for the animals mm -hmm. um there are so many different things. All these artists that are reaching out to us now with digital art and fantastic artwork and even jewellery, um, you know, it just all these sort of things that help spread the word. Um, but if you are a, a true student and you're in, in the academic path, uh, mm -hmm. that's a slightly different twist on how you can help out. Uh, in that case, I would say don't always focus on the academics, but try and get some field experience by volunteering. And you don't necessarily have to volunteer at a whale or a dolphin project to learn skills that are applicable to a whale and dolphin project. Exactly. You, know, yeah. you, you might volunteer at an NGO that's doing coral reef ecology or an NGO that is um, a sanctuary for elephants. And then that skill set will still transfer to being able to help at a whale and dolphin sanctuary or to, to help um, if you're working with someone like myself. And it can be simple things like how to back a trailer down the, the boat ramp. Uh, and, and also, if you are going to volunteer at projects, be realistic. You know, I get hundreds of requests a week. And most of them are all, they have what I call me-itis. Me, 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 me. It's all, it's all about them. And it's not about wanting to help the animals. Mm -hmm. And there are some real gems out there, people who, who are willing to do the grunt work and the hard work that, that keeps a research project like this running. Right. And, and I've had to do them and I still do them. Um, it can be from cleaning toilets and washing dishes to... Uh, you know, answering emails and entering data and washing down the boat at the end of the day. Uh, so, but academically, your classes can be really, really wide. I studied psychology, limnology, which is freshwater ecosystems, entomology, mm -hmm. which is insects, um, geography. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the things that weren't specifically animal related. And each one of those things has been really helpful. So, for example, psychology, um, being able to understand how people work because people are part of the solution as well as part of the problem. Exactly. And comparative okay. psychology. I mean, the study yes. of how different species think. Right. And behave. Right. I mean, Absolutely. that is critically important to yeah. study any non-human yeah. being. Absolutely. And I would think even understanding humans. I mean, we're well, an animal. Yeah, there's right? that too, yeah. And, and you know, again, you know, you don't have to always be out in the field to be making a big difference. I've got two colleagues that are absolutely phenomenal, uh, Matt and Natalie, and they're both lawyers that have specialized in whale and dolphins. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so they, I call on them literally every week for various things, mm -hmm. um, whether it's helping changing legislation or it's whether looking at contracts that are going to help with volunteers so there's just so many different things that you can do and put your hand to the skill set that you have the passion for that you can then apply to helping whales and dolphins. Exactly. That's perfect uh, advice. Just find, you know, whatever it is that you like to do on yeah. a day-to-day -day basis is the form it should take. Yeah. 
Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Yeah, and, um, and look, go go to World Orca Day as well, Laurie, yeah. on our website, and we've got a list of supporters, and there's different companies that are supporting us in different ways too. So That's right. They might have a product that they donate that we can use as prizes, or they might have a product that we can use um, in our field work, or they might be spreading the word on social media, or they might be, you know, there's all sorts of different things. They're creating mm-hmm. things and selling them and donating some of the profits to different research projects around the world and different um, educational programs. Exactly. So, yeah, there's there's some really great supporters in there that, that I would encourage everybody to check out. Well, Ingrid, how old were you when you had your first sighting of an orca or an encounter? Oh, <laughs> uh, I probably would have been somewhere around 16, 17, because mm-hmm. we were living on the yacht and sailing around the world. Um, my, my parents were both from the Netherlands and they came to New Zealand and I was born here with my, my sister was born here too. And our parents decided that they wanted to go back to the Netherlands and take us. And they went to a travel agent and they said, you know, family of four, go to Europe, a little bit of a tiki tour, come home. How much will that cost? And um, the travel agent gave my dad a price and he went, oh, good Lord, I could buy a boat and sail around the world for that. <laughs> uh, so, so he did. <laughs> and, and that's how we, we ended up on our, our wee adventure. But yeah, so, but I only saw them off in the distance. I didn't get any real close encounters. That wasn't until I was actually enrolled at university and mm-hmm. I was studying oysters at a oh. marine biology lab yeah well at least it starts with o <laughs> um <laughs> and because i had to get into marine biology somehow and you can't couldn't i couldn't find anybody who was willing to take the risk on a subject like orca here in new zealand because no one had studied them before mm-hmm. so the idea being if i got my masters in marine biology then i would be able to transition into a phd Uh, It didn't go quite as smoothly as that for various reasons, because then when I went to do my PhD, they said, well, you need to do um, at least a two year feasibility study to see if it'll work, which I could have done as my master's, of course. But, you know, here we are. (laughs) Anyway, I was at the marine laboratory um, studying the uh, the oysters and these orca came in and that was my first real close encounter with them. Wow. Wow. So I was 20 two I think so Mm -hmm. yeah 21 22 and so uh you know there's that passion that I've had since six years old and I haven't seen an orca up close until then uh you know that's it's a long time to hold on to your dream but here we are now I'm 30 years on and I'm chatting to you about world orca day yeah it it was worth it hell yeah (laughs) um let me ask you this, and, and it sort of refers to a number of questions here. Do you ever see any of these communities of orcas changing their culture? Have you been able to uh, observe cultural changes at all in any of these over time? Well, I guess it depends on what you define as a cultural change. Um, yeah. You know, if you look at the orca in Argentina, for example, mm-hmm. uh, together with Juan and Jorge, we're, we're presenting a paper Uh, and along with some other colleagues on the social networking and how that's changing over time with these animals. And we're trying to look at what's driving those changes in the social networking. Uh, So you could argue that that's a change in the culture when the the networking just does this dramatic shift like this. Uh, But is it? Because we've only looked at this window of our research period, which I believe is now coming up on uh, 20 years for that population. Mm-hmm. 20 years is not a long time in, a, in the span of a culture. So is that just a little glitch in the system or is that actually a true cultural shift? Uh, but in terms of things like animals changing or ecotypes changing their food prey types or dramatic changes in their distribution, I haven't observed anything like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are a few papers that talk about um, every time a scientist discovers something new that an ecotype is feeding on, but that doesn't mean that they weren't doing it before. It just means that we've become aware of it now. So uh, the, the one thing that I would say for the New Zealand orca is that when I first started studying them and 
I watched them taking rays, I would find a lot of liver pieces and, and sometimes even whole livers floating at the surface and the orca were feeding on the rays themselves. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I very, very rarely see the liver at the surface and um, mostly the rays are left or only partially eaten. Mm -hmm. So there has been a shift in the, the parts of the prey that these animals are targeting predominantly. I mean, they still do both types, but sure. um, predominantly there's that shift. And I'm still not certain what's driving that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. That's it. And, you know, so many of these cultural traditions that we all observe have been, they could have been, you know, uh, begun thousands of years ago. I mean, thousands of years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, so we're, we're coming in just in the middle of it. And who knows yeah. how often these things really change because we're well, not there at the beginning. Absolutely. And I mean, in reality, Laurie, whale and dolphin research in the field, like the, the type of things that we do. Yeah. It's really only been going since the early 1960s so within my lifetime I mean I was born in 1966 mm -hmm. right and and so if you put it in that into perspective we we really have only got a tiny little glimpse of what's going on in the the span of any one individual orca's life even let right. alone a whole culture and the and the amazing thing I mean we would never know about any of these things if we just studied them in tanks oh absolutely it, I mean Everything that's on the cutting edge right now of cetacean research, what we're learning is really done in the field. Yeah. The, the culture, the tool use, the social networking, the communication, everything is all being revealed by field studies because Absolutely. none of that can happen in an artificial environment like a tank. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm with you 100%, Laurie. I'm, I have always been concerned about orca in captivity, and I think more of us need to speak up for these animals. And I feel that it's becoming more normalized to have this conversation now. If, if you yes. and I had had this webinar even 10 years ago and we had spoken about the the issues with orca in captivity, we would have been vilified. We would have been, the, you know, mm -hmm. pretty much a problem. Um, nowadays, yeah. it's the fact that everybody's having these conversations and we're starting to see legislation coming online, like Canada. I mean, they're leading the world with that, right? It's, oh, my it's gosh, phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, and so protecting whales and dolphins in captivity as well as preventing them going into captivity, those are the things that we can do right now. We can make a massive difference immediately mm -hmm. to these animals' lives. And I, you know, it's not a question of a debate anymore. The science yes. tells us that these animals have very poor lives, both physically and mentally. And tanks. I mean, it's not a surprise. It shouldn't be given what we know about how they live normally, their yeah. evolutionary history. So the science is, continues to tell us that it doesn't work keeping orcas in concrete tanks. Yeah. Um, but I do want to turn to uh, we if we could hang in there for a little while longer. Oh, I'm, I'm willing to. Okay, because we still have black hour. people with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there's some questions here about whether you're going to be involved with the whale sanctuary uh, project sanctuary when it comes online and and you bet um if we especially you know if we're going to have orcas we're going to want to tap into the world's experts and orca behavior and you are an expert in orca behavior extraordinaire so i mean of course you're going to be involved do you have any um what is, I mean, I know you have yourself envisioned sanctuary in New Zealand for, for orcas. Um, what does it mean to you to have sanctuaries for orcas coming out of the concrete tanks and going into a more natural environment? I, I can't imagine what it would be like for an orca to transition from that but I think we all get the tiniest little bit of a glimpse, just a glimmer of what that might be like when we consider what most of us went through during lockdowns. 
and then when the lockdowns were lifted, how we felt very confined in our homes, and yet we still had social media and, and TV and, and our families and the telephone, and we could order food in or we could, right. you know, go to the supermarket and, and still get the food that we liked. And, and that, that change for us, though, to be in that lockdown, and it really wasn't a true lockdown in the sense that these animals are experiencing. No. If we take that and, and we imagine how it would be for an animal that's gone from a, a, a blue box into suddenly this, in the real world, yeah. right? The open yeah. ocean, but with a, with a um, net around it to protect them so that we can still keep caring for them properly. That transition must be mind-blowing for them. I mean, Especially you, the ones that are born in captivity. They oh, have no idea that no. life can be anything other than what it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's also something that I find very uh, confusing that the captivity industry says, well, an animal that's born in captivity can't go into a sanctuary because it doesn't know any different. Well, that, that's just wrong. And because it doesn't know any different doesn't mean that it wouldn't experience the improved welfare if you put it in a sanctuary. And we know, look, we know that if you're born in captivity, it doesn't give you any benefit in terms of being able to cope with captivity. So the, yeah. the problems that you see, stress-related diseases and stereotypies that you see yeah. in wild-caught orcas put in tanks are found in captive orcas. Yes. And yes. that is because it doesn't fit these animals. You have to look at the evolutionary history of these animals. And they have a physiology and a brain that is expecting a certain environment. It doesn't get that in the tank. So it doesn't matter that they were born. I mean, if they're in, born into the tanks, they're not domesticated. No, they're wild, no. They're wild animals. Absolutely. They and they're look, their brains are looking for the same inputs that any orca is yeah. looking for well, yeah you don't undo evolution in a single generation <laughs> no. by being no. born in a concrete tank so no. uh, yeah no no it's it's really tragic and and look i know that um i want to do a little plug for the whale sanctuary project here because i know that you guys are looking for funding and and uh you know like the orca research trust and like myself um, we don't get government funding we don't get university right. funding we're all we're all scrambling um, to try and and make uh, this work on tight budgets so it would be really great if people can check out the whale sanctuary project i know that you guys are looking for donations and thank you yeah it, it's a really valuable project to be involved in and i'm truly honored to be on the board of advisors laurie well we are honored to have you for sure um I wonder if uh, you might, uh, let's see, there's something about, um, here's a question from Viet. Are orcas able to differentiate humans from other animals? I think the answer is yes. I think if they couldn't, there'd be a fundamental flaw in the way that they process things. Right. I mean, they, exactly. they, they distinguish, you look at different ecotypes, for example, uh, here in New Zealand, the coastal orca, they don't feed on pinnipeds. They don't feed on seals or sea lions. Uh, and yet they'll swim right past a seal or a sea lion. It's not like there are no seals or sea lions here for them to feed on. They right. just don't feed them. So they can distinguish between a seal and a sea lion uh, or a dolphin. Even if they're mammal eaters, they're still not feeding on the seals. So if they can distinguish between those two things, surely they can distinguish between a human and a dolphin or a human and a penguin or and they, even, and, even and individual and, humans. Well, I was going to say, I mean, farmed animals like cows and pigs can um, distinguish one human from another. Yeah. Well, um, well when I most, work with... Many animals can, right? Right. Oh, yeah, for sure. And when I worked with uh, Keiko, 
when I was with the Ocean Futures mm -hmm. Project uh, and, and Ocean Futures Society, sorry, and I was working with Keiko from Free Willy in Iceland. And it was very interesting to see how he reacted to different people and mm -hmm. uh, how he had different behaviors that he would do for certain trainers and not for the others. And certain caregivers he would um, be really engaged with and other caregivers. He was like, oh, well, you know, feed me the fish. I mean, you know, that's it. Thank you very much. Like you, but don't love you. <laughs> and and no. so, you know, he was, he was very, very, he had strong personality and he had a strong um leanings towards individuals so sure they can distinguish humans as individuals as well well it's interesting you mentioned Keiko because there are a lot of questions about Keiko and you were involved in that project there are a lot of people involved in the whale sanctuary project including our executive director Charles Vinnick and uh, Jeff Foster and so many people who were on the Keiko project and that was a, a, about 20 years ago or so. What did we learn, uh, you know, what, what was the thing you took away from that project? And do you consider that project um, a successful return or reintroduction? Well, let, let's start and go in reverse. Uh, yes, I do consider it successful. Uh, I was there when Keiko was out way 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 away from the sanctuary site and mm -hmm. I watched him surfing down waves and it was big storm and I was really seasick <laughs> and <laughs> and uh you know just but the joy of watching him surfing down these waves and just just going for it uh that alone just made my heart sore and and I think that there are so many people who look at it and they say well he died Yes, he died. But in the same period that he was going through his rehabilitation, mm -hmm. how many orca died in captivity? And I forget the exact number, but I believe it was in excess of five individuals died in, in tanks, yeah. in concrete tanks, yeah. while he was being rehabilitated. Um, and people say that it was a failure because he didn't integrate with the other orca pods. Well, not necessarily because he made the choice not to do that. Or potentially they made the choice not to do that and didn't include him. But mm -hmm. he was still free until the day he died. And he made the choice to swim from Iceland to Norway. And the veterinary evidence shows that um, he hadn't lost weight. And there's no way he could have swum that distance without um, showing okay. some signs of weight loss if he wasn't feeding himself. Uh, so he made a lot of decisions for himself during that period. And that alone for me was enough to say that, that it was a success. But I think also we, we had incredible advances in technology, the use of satellite tracking devices for whales and dolphins made leaps and bounds like nobody had seen before because of the project with Keiko. Um, we understood a lot about the processes of sanctuaries and that's being implemented today. I know that there are the, the right. team that were involved with the design of the nets and the implementation of all of the CPEN and everything, right. they're advisors to the sanctuary project. And, you know, so that the building on that, it had to start somewhere and it exactly. started with him. Yeah, exactly. And a lot was learned, but I mean, right. we, like and, you said, and, I mean, Sorry, sorry, Laurie, I didn't no, mean to please. cut you off. And, and I don't mean that it didn't, that there weren't other rescue programs and rehabilitation programs for whales and dolphins, but in terms sure. of orca, um, he was the start for the orca process. And, and there was lots of stuff, great stuff that was done with whales and dolphins prior to that, but um, Keiko was certainly a pivotal point. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And he did enjoy an incredible quality of life. I'm just going to lean over here. To close my window because we have rain, oh, <laughs> rain wow. and wind, um, uh, which is very uncommon. Uh, okay, well, I hope it's not too hot for you in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Let it rain. We need it. Um, let's see. Um, maybe just a couple more questions. Uh, we have, you know, so many. Um, what are your suggested top three areas of research and conservation you think organizations, scientists, researchers, advocates should be focusing on right now? Great question. 
Wow, that is again, that's a whole webinar just in and of, in and of itself, right? Uh, I think as much as it's the big picture and, and it seems insurmountable at the moment, the only way that we're going to really make a change is to keep banging on the drum about it is climate change. That, that's, that's the great overarching thing that impacts all of us, including the orca. That's and, right. Uh, again, you know, it's normalizing that conversation and it's just having that conversation frequently enough that it is part of the norm in terms of not that we ignore it because it's a baseline, but that we, we recognize that it's a problem and we have to deal with it. Um, in terms of orca specifically, obviously for me, the issue of cetaceans in captivity. Uh, and there's some great inroads being made, but it's not happening fast enough for those individuals that are suffering at the moment. So I really right. think we really need to knuckle down and, and, and laser focus on these aquariums and get legislation in place like Canada has done and some other countries. Um, you know, my hat off to them. I've been trying to get legislation changed here in New Zealand. We don't have yeah. any whales and dolphins here, but there is this weird mentality that because we don't have in, in captivity, I mean, <laughs> um, because we don't have them in captivity, we don't need the laws in place, which to me is crazy because it's logical to do it when you don't have them here it's easy to implement them mm -hmm. uh, so yeah bang on the drum about that uh, and in terms of individual populations of orca I think it it comes down to the usual basket of evils um, it's pollution whether that be noise pollution or plastic pollution or chemical pollution yeah. uh, it is um, overfishing uh, you know, no matter what species the animal is feeding on, if you are a bigs orca or a transient orca and you're feeding on a sea lion, that sea lion has to get fish, that fish has to come from somewhere. So it's that whole case, cascade thing. Okay. And I think it, it's habitat degradation in so many different levels um, for each of these populations. It doesn't matter where these orca live, they, they have habitat degradation. And Problems with boats, whether it's shipping noise problems, uh, you know, that there's some, some really great documentaries out there about that um, for cetaceans, um, or whether it is uh, pile driving or, you know, there's just so many problems with, with boats and, and other noise in the environment, boat strike, entanglements. I mean, where does it, yeah. Yeah, baskets, I mean, it, of baskets of problems, and and some of them are pretty easy to solve if we actually wanted to. I, I I often say this, Laurie, and I think you've heard me say it when we've been having conversations. Look, we put a man on the moon. Surely we can do something to help these animals, right? Well, I you know I think that's absolutely right. And and all of us who witnessed the beautiful images from the Webb Telescope this week, yeah. Um, I mean, I marveled at them, but I also kept thinking in my mind, we can do that. Why can't we do all these other things? And yeah. we can, we can, yeah. like you said, a man on the moon, then we can protect workers and other animals and in so many different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think I'm going to end on that note because it is such a phenomenal mm -hmm. uh insight to to end on. I, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us. There have been so many phenomenal questions. We will record those questions. And then if Ingrid wants to reach out to any of you, she can do that. We can do oh, that. Oh, Laurie, don't promise that. I'm so swamped at the moment. But I, will, I, will, <laughs> I know, I'll, I know. I'll, try, and, I'll least... try and do some social media posts about some of the Social media posts. Posts. That would be a yeah. better yeah. thing because there's yeah. so many. Um, I want, you know, just Ingrid, thank you so much for sharing your life, for your sure. research and your advocacy and um, just for, for all the, the decades of work that you have done and continue to do um, on behalf of, of these, these beautiful animals. Um, we're all indebted to you for that. And uh, we're honored to have you as part of the Whale Sanctuary Project. Um, and look forward to a time when um, captivity for orcas is a thing of the past. Yeah, and yeah. 
and orcas can be allowed to live in the ocean where they evolve and, and thrive there. Absolutely. Um, and look right back at you, Laurie. Thank you for the invite to join you on World Orca Day. Um, yeah, what a pleasure. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, been a real thrill for me. And let's do another webinar again. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Thank, thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you for your questions. Thanks, team. See you all somewhere sometime. Bye. Yes. Be well, everyone.